This meeting is United being States recorded. Kind of right now, right? The world is kind of messed up. Um, you know, there are some times when things just work out for us. Um, Scott last week was sharing how um, the, uh, the elevators just kind of were there for his assistant when she came and she gave God, said, God's got to be blessing you because of this happen. Uh, this is really strong. Can, you, can this tree turn down the, the monitor? It's kind of odd hearing yourself feedback so much. Okay, so things sometimes just work out. It's, it's, they turned it down, I think. Um, and uh, sometimes things don't work out. Sometimes we find ourselves asking, why are things so hard? I'm working I'm doing all of this, I'm doing the right stuff, but things just don't come out the way I think they should. Lord, why are things so hard? I mean, I, 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 I try. I really do try to be a good Christian. I, I've given up my free time to help. Um, I, uh, uh, I've come to China to serve you. Why are things not working out the way I think they should? Shouldn't me coming to China count for something? I mean, come on, God. I was on vacation last week, and what, all, what I did on vacation was I prepared for this message. Things should work out for me, right? I'm sacrificing for you. But sometimes we say, I mean, sometimes we look and we say that our money's not going as far as it should, right? Our, our skills are just not enough to, to do the job that we we want to do. Um, we don't have the tenacity or the strength. Um, do you ever feel that way? Do you ever feel just out of sync? Uh, when I was younger, we used to say we feel like a 45 record playing at uh, 33 speed. And if you get that, you're old like me. Uh, this is exactly what we see in Haggai, what's, what's happening. Things just aren't working out for the Israelites. Um, in chapter 1, verse 6, uh, God tells them, see, you've sown much and you harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them in a bag with holes. Things weren't just work, weren't working out for them. Uh, the way they were supposed to work out. It just wasn't working. But by the end of the passage today, God says that that's over. I'm going to bless you from this day forward. So what changed? How did these people go from struggling to make things uh, ends meet, not having enough to eat, not having enough food, not having enough clothes to keep them warm, uh, to being blessed. And that's what we're going to look at today. Pray with me. Father God, I praise you, and I do pray, as, as Jacob was saying, that we, I would find pleasure in presenting your word. Um, and I pray that your word would penetrate in our hearts today, that we would feel challenged, and we would walk out of here changed in just a bit and challenged to move on into your hope that you provide. In Jesus' name, amen. So, this passage we're looking at today nails the heart of the matter. That was a weird ring. Um, how is your relationship with God doing? How is your holiness? What's your your vision of God's holiness. Are you doing for God? Or are you being in God? Are you working for your holiness? Are you relying or are you relying on God for your holiness? And my, my thesis today is that doing does not result in being, but being results in doing. Let me say that again. Doing does not result in being, but being will result in doing. 
My thesis, I think, the parallel passage, I think, in New Testament, was when Jesus says, remain in me and I in you, just as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, you must remain in the vine. And so neither can you unless you remain in me. So it's about remaining in God. So there's a lot of people who call themselves Christians today who believe their behaviors, their actions, the things they do make them closer to God. The things we do have an appearance of godliness sometimes. 2 Timothy 3. But the problem lies in that that's it. Sometimes we rely on that appearance to be godly. The, the, the focus is your heart. What's your heart's motivation? What is on your inside, your deep reasons for doing what you do? Haggai's first message in chapter 1 is, God will grant true blessing when we put his house first. When they turn from building their lives and their houses to building God's temple and his house. In this third message, and this is kind of a parallel passage, he hearkens back to that first message. He, he, he says, it says uh, or the, the point is, God will grant true blessing when we put his house first from righteous lives, from the righteous motivation, from the right motivation. Consider this, our walk. In fact, God says, consider twice in chapter 1 and three times in chapter 2. Consider is used multiple times uh, in this little book, in those little two messages. God really wants this Jewish remnant, and by extension us, to consider something deeply, to understand something. And then at the end um, of the message, I have a practical tool that you can use to help consider your life, how you're doing. Let's br brief, uh, briefly visit the context. I know we we've, we've look at it every time we, mention, we talk. <clears throat> but uh, the remnant of the Jews who return to the land of Palestine, they're, they're, they're coming to rebuild Jerusalem, to rebuild God's temple. Um, they were, by all accounts, God's people. I mean, they've chosen to leave Persia, now a country who took over Babylon, now a country who's kind of favorable, uh, and, and they've chosen to leave a, some st their stable lives, their, their, their friends, and to return to Jerusalem. Uh, they're on mission to Jerusalem. These were committed followers of God. They returned to rebuild, rebuild the temple, rebuild Jerusalem, make God's people great again. And they started pretty well. But 15 or 16 years later, here we are in Haggai. And Haggai is calling them, telling them the, uh, you know, get back to it in Haggai 1. But now in Haggai Two in this third message, the temple foundation has been laid. The people have returned their focus uh, to the vision of rebuilding God's presence with them. And that's what the temple represents. It represents God's presence with them. And so when they focus on their own home, their focus was not on God's presence with them. Um, the, this is about 553, 55-ish years before the Holy Spirit came and made our hearts God's temple, God's presence with us in our hearts. And so we are now the temple of God, Christians, collectively and individually. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. When God's Spirit filled the temple in uh, 2 Chronicles 7, it did so with fire. It came, God in fire came down, consumed the offering that was being presented, and God's 
glory filled the temple. In Pentecost, fire came on the disciples' heads, and his glory entered them and filled the temple. We are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit if you're a Christian. We are the temple of God. And so this message, we can, we can apply it in, in that way. Uh, in this Haggai's third message to the remnant who returned, the book tells us exactly what day in history this happened. It happened on December 18th, 520 B.C. That's the 24th of the ninth month in the second year of Darius. Or Darius. Uh, that's December 18th. Two months uh, beyond uh, Haggai's previous message. And what's interesting, it's just one month after Zechariah's first prophetic message. And in this uh, Zechariah's message, uh, he's calling them back to their hearts, back, and he's saying, don't be like your forefathers who, because of their rejection of me, ha were taken away to Babylon. In Zechariah 6, it says that they repented, they returned to the Lord. And so God, historically, in a sense here, is using Haggai and Zechariah as a one-two punch to them, to the heart. Haggai speaks this prophetic message we heard about yesterday, last week with, with uh, Colin. Zechariah speaks, and now Zach Haggai hits him again. And so God is really working on them. So... Let's look at the passage today, and this passage breaks down into two sections, basically. Uh, verses 10 through 14 is God's teaching on holiness, and verses 15 to 19 is the application of how this teaching has worked itself out in their lives. And really, this, it's, it's a, from a negative perspective, but then ends on a high note. Okay, follow as we read together. Uh, yeah. If you have a, a Bible, it's probably easier for you to see than that. On the 24th day of the ninth month, the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priest about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? And the priest answered and said, no. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? And the priest answered and said, yes, it does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so is it, I mean, so is it with this people, and with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so, with every work of their hands, and what they offer is unclean. Now then, consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of twenty measures, and there were but ten, when one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you with all the products of, my, of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. Um, he starts with this question and answer process. And he, he, it's not like a Socratic uh, discussion, there's expected answers. Um, so the first question and answer is, if meat is made ceremonially holy and it's wrapped in a robe, by the way, in Leviticus, it says that meat made ceremonial holy will uh, 
make the robe holy also because it's the priests. And so there is a connection there in, the, in Levitical. But as the priest answered, it does not make anything it touches holy. Holiness is not a contagion. Holiness is not a contagion. It, it's not something you can just catch by being around people. If I'm sick, I can't catch health. And we are all sick. You can't just catch holiness. Um, or as I heard many years ago, going to church does not make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. So you can't just change who you are based on, in a, in a good way, based on where you live. There's a lot of people out there who claim to be Christians, yet when you ask them what makes them a Christian, they'll fumble through an answer. And there are usually, there's three, actually there are, there are three types of answers people give to that question. Either one, this is most likely what we see here is, I'm a Christian because my parents were Christians. I'm a Christian because I grew up in a Christian nation. I'm a Christian because um, I go to church. I'm a Christian because I do Bible study. I pray. Uh, I, I, I'm a Christian because the atmosphere, uh, I'm with people, and therefore, obviously, I'm a Christian. Um, uh, I'm a Christian. The other is I'm a Christian because of what I do. And a little bit of that was like I go to church, I pray, I read my Bible, um, I don't cuss, I don't drink, I do this, I don't do that, right? It's a, it's a works-based Christianity. The first one was Christianity associ uh, by association. This is a works-based Christianity. The the third one, and the, of course the answer that we want to hear is based on what Jesus did for me. Romans 10, 9, and 10 is, is the, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Um, you must come to this point when you personally submit your all to Him. See, God doesn't, doesn't ask you to do anything less than giving your all to Him. Um, we used to have this, uh, there used to be this saying that, oh, Christianity is free. You can become a Christian. It's free. But it's not, actually. It commands your entire being. He wants you completely. True Christianity is a deep faith-based relationship with God that results in life that naturally produces the fruit of that faith. Christianity is a deep, faith-based relationship with God that results in a life that naturally produces the fruit of faith. Anything less than that is less than Christianity, is less than what God demands as holiness. Um, the second question is the other side of that. If someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, and these are those, those, that list of food items that, that he listed above, does it, do they become unclean? And the answer is yes. Now, coming in contact with a dead body was a sure way of becoming unclean. It was, it was like the natural way to ruin your day. Is don't, don't come in contact with a dead body. Not good. If anyone came in contact with a dead body, they had to say, I'm unclean, don't come near me, until they were able to go through the ritual and the sacrifices to become clean again. Because they would then make you unclean. So sin, uncleanness, is a contagion. You can... Let me get back to my notes so I don't get off. A sick child, let me say this. A sick child with a virus will make a healthy child sick. 
The healthy child will not make the sick child healthy. It's a truism to say that that bad company corrupts good people. It's absolutely true. Uh, Some things we need to remember with this principle in reality. And and Scripture says, uh, do not be unequally yoked. Being unequally yoked, he's not just talking about marriage here. He's talking about who you're tying yourself to. It it does apply to marriage, okay? It applies to dating. You know, guys and girls, if they're not Christians and you're a Christian, don't date them. They will pull you down. You're not going to, your Christianity is not going to pull them up and make them Christians. They're going to pull you down. They're going to distract you. They're going to make your life about their desires and about what they desire because Christianity is our uh, having to stay focused on the Lord. Um, Missionary dating is not good. Um, If if you're going to business, try not to partner up with a non-Christian. Not smart, because their focus is different than your focus. You're going to be going in two different directions. When you have a, a trusted friend who, who, you, uh, uh, who you look for for advice, don't make that cr- trusted friend a Christian, I mean a non-Christian. Don't, don't confide in Christian. I, we had one friend who, who was having a hard time. She was a Christian. Her husband was a Christian. They were having a hard time in their marriage, and this lady went to a non-Christian friend for advice. And what do you think their non-Christian friend said? Well, you should leave him. You should leave him. Because, see, her focus wasn't on, well, you're married under God, and you need to stay with him, and you guys need to work this out, because your marriage is a testament of who of God's love for us. No, her focus is on, well, you're not happy, therefore, go find someone else. Don't justify your sin, your hanging out in the wrong places uh, because you think uh, as a Christian you're strong enough to handle it. Now, I'm not saying lock yourself in a monastery and and don't be a part of this world because we're called to be in this world. But, but set yourself up for success, not failure. You might need to stop doing some things. You might need to stop doing some things to set yourself up to, to have a devoted life to God. And the lesson that he talks about here, we're going to come back to that later at the end of the message. The second part, and what I call the response, doesn't quite fit, but the response is he starts it out by saying, consider. And we, I talked about that word consider is used multiple times. It's used three times here in this passage, in this message, and then it's used twice in the previous parallel passage in, in chapter 1. God wants his people to consider what he's saying. The term consider in Hebrew is actually two Two terms, two words, and it's and I have no idea how to say it. But it's sum as S U M, which means to place or to put. And labab, labab I don't know, meaning in the innermost part, the mind, the soul, that which is inside. So he's, he's saying consider. This considers to internalize this information so it becomes part of who you are, part of your daily decision making processes. What are they being told to consider? Well, two things. Two things. Their past sin. And to be more accurate, the results of this past sin. He says, consider this day before stone was placed upon stone. Before you repented and came back to me. Before you, you took your eyes off of your situation and you put it back onto me. How did you fare? When this situation was first addressed in chapter 1, 
they're told basically the same thing, right? You have sown much and harvested little. And here they say the same thing. Uh, you expect to get ten, you get five. So it says, thus says the Lord, in uh, chapter, uh, verse 7. So in verse 5, he says, consider. Verse 7, he says, consider your ways. And God, so God bookmarks this message with this admonition to consider, think about, internalize this lesson. In this present message, though, God is telling his people now to reflect back on their disobedience. How did taking your eyes off of God and not building my temple, not continuing with my vision, how did that work out for you? Not very well, did it? You worked hard and did not see the results you expected. Not because you were unlucky, but because, verse 7, I, God, struck you and all the products of your toil. I struck you with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me. The goal of God's discipline is always to call us back to him. It's always to call us back to him for the purpose, chapter 1, verse 8, that I may take pleasure in it, that God may take pleasure in your returning, and that I, God, may be glorified. So the purpose of God's discipline is always to call you back to him for his glory, to turn from your way and to follow his way. Contrary to what some modern so-called preachers will tell you, God does not save you so that you can have a healthy, wealthy, comfortable life. That's not what it's about. God saves you so he could use you in his kingdom. If he chooses to give you comfort and wealth, that should be his choice, not because you pursued it. That is not what this life is all about for us Christians. You Christians should be about building his kingdom through humbling yourself, spreading his word, encouraging others, building others up uh, more than yourself. It's not about you, your comfortable lifestyle. It's about God, God's kingdom come. As a Christian, if I make my life about me, I'm choosing to fight against God who chose me and saved me. If I'm a Christian, if I'm truly a Christian, if I hold the Holy Spirit, and I'm His temple, and I choose to make my life about me, I am choosing to fight against the God who saved me. And so, of course, things aren't going to work out for me. Consider your ways, Christian. Refocus your priorities. We serve a jealous God. If you are His, yet turn away from Him and chase after your own comfort, wealth, etc., etc., He will call you back. And He will use various means to do that. Not always how He did it here, but He will call you back. Sometimes He will make your life difficult until you repent and come back. He wants your undivided de devotion. A Christian is never more miserable than when they're pursuing their own pleasure because the Holy Spirit who lives in you is fighting for you to bring you back. A Christian is never more miserable when they're pursuing their own pleasure. So the, the second section is talking about a, a future, oh, past sin, we just talked about that, a future hope. He says, now consider from this day onward, since the day that the foundation of the temp, Lord's temple was laid. Don't consider. So he's saying, now that you've come back to me, you're back on track with my vision that what I want you to do, now that you're obeying me, consider from this day forward. Both here and and in verse 15, the Israelites are told to consider. Once, it's about consider your sin and the results of that. Here, consider your obedience. Here they are told to consider the hope 
That is in God's blessing because of their obedience, because they're pursuing Him. Verse 19, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing yet. The seed has been planted. There, it's not in the barn. That's the, that's the answer there. The seed's not in the barn. They don't have seed. It's all been planted. They're hopeful for, this, uh, uh, for the crop to come in. God says, from this day on, because you've come back to me, because you've repented, I will bless you. This coming harvest will not be limited. It will provide you with enough. Uh, I believe also, based on the prophetic nature of Haggai's okay, second and the fourth message that kind of bookmarked this, this message, that there's a nod toward the ultimate blessing, and that is Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ, He pours out His blessing and you know what? When we're walking with Him, things just kind of work. Um, and it's true. And it may not be in the world's eyes, you know, you don't, uh, all this happens, but little things. We went to uh, uh, Elder Rainier's kind of farewell, and, and we had no idea where to park. Uh, Scott was driving, and we had no idea where to park. We didn't know where the, the gate was. And so, so we parked in the big parking lot, right? And we're like, it took us like five minutes to to finally break down and say, okay, we'll call him. <laughs> and so, so we went all the way down, like half a block, went in the gate, but then we came all the way back to his, where his apart, new apartment was, and he said, uh, uh, he said, oh, you parked right there. Yeah, I can let you out the gate right there with the, where your car is. Um, and parking in, in China, if you know parking in China, is not the funnest thing in the world. But we got this perfect parking spot. It was just right there. And, and these little things, I really believe, because God is in charge of everything, right? He's, he's in charge of everything. I think these little things are his little blessings. You know, he says, yeah, here. You know what? You don't know where to park. Let me open up a spot right there for you. Um, it's kind of, I, I, I thank God for it. Even these little things. Um, I believe God blesses us if we are obedient to Him. If we follow Him, not we check the box and we go to church, we, we do this, we do this, we do this. All right, God, now I'm waiting for your blessing. Okay, that's not the attitude to have it. The attitude is, God, I want to know you more. I want to know you deeper. You are, you're going to be my bridegroom. And I want to know who you are. I think of Peter when, when he's been fishing all night. And God tells him, I mean, Jesus tells him to cast his net on the other side. And, and Peter obeys. And he caught, catches an abundance of fish. And what's the result? The result is Peter glorifies God. And that's the result of God's blessing, right? He wants us to glorify him. Um, lesson learned. This remnant had continued to sacrifice even though they were building their own houses, even though they didn't follow what God wanted them to do, but they kept sacrificing. They kept doing the things that they as Jews, as God's people, should do. But he didn't bless them because of it. It says what they offer is unclean because their heart wasn't there. All their, all their sacrifices were simply unclean rubbish. Their focus was not on God, but on building. They're building their own homes. Uh, in the same way, if you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, repented of making the life He gave you all about you, then everything you do is like filthy rags. Until you have 
that relationship with Jesus Christ, nothing matters except your relationship with Jesus Christ and except um, your, that you would repent. Isaiah 64, 6 says, we are all as an unclean thing and all of our righteousness are as unclean rags, filthy rags. Romans 3, 10 says, as, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. In the same way, the remnant was not being blessed because their focus was elsewhere on their own houses, on their own comfort, on their own families. In that same way, when our focus is not on God, there's some things that won't work out because God's going to that's for Christians. God's going to be calling you back. Now, the major curse for non-Christians is when God just says, fine, you go do your own thing. And he lets you suffer the consequences of your own sin. And we don't ever want to be in that situation. We see that happen to countries, and countries crumble because of that. Lives crumble because of that. But... the Jewish remnant repented and got their priorities straight. And God promises that to bless them. Um, Matthew 6.33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And these things are your daily bread, your clothing, necessities of life. Holiness, or being a true Christian, because when you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit indwells you and you're declared holy. God sees you as a holy, holy vessel of his spirit because he's cleansed you. Despite your sin, despite your stumbles and everything, he still declares you holy right now. So being holy is not a list of tasks to accomplish. Give to the church, give to the poor, serve others, and so on and so forth. It is a heart-level impulse that seeks God's righteousness above all that will result in doing the things for His purpose and for His glory. My, I, I love my wife. We've been married 30 years. Um, my life, wife loves me. And we love each other no matter what we do. I do some really stupid things. And I upset her. And she still loves me. And she does some things that upset me. But I still love her. And um, it doesn't matter. There's some things I've done that are awful. But we're still together. And I have to uh, understand. And after 30 years, I, I'm starting to understand that I need to be less so that our relationship can be better. Our rela it's about our relationship. And, if I, and I, I love my wife so much that I know the things she doesn't like and I know the things she likes. And I want to do the things that she likes to please her. And I don't want to do the things that she doesn't like because life is just happier. <laughs> Um, and I think that's the same thing with our relationship with God. You need to get to know God as well as you can so that you know the things that help, please Him. And you know what? This may sound strange, but the things that please Him in Scott's life may not be the same things that please Him in my life. So I need to get, him, get to know God better and better for myself. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So how do you know that what pleases God is in His Word? I was going to bring a Bible, a Bible up here, but that, was, that definitely would just be like a prop because I don't use a, bi a paper Bible anymore. It's all phone or iPad or computer. 
Um, but we all have a phone, iPad, or computer, or, or some kind of electronic device. We have no excuse not to read, not to listen to our Bible. I'm going back and I'm li- uh, reading a book uh, called the, the Disciplines of a Godly Man. I read it when I was in, in seminary, and I, I dug it out again, or I discovered it again, let's say that, um, and I'm, I'm slowly plodding through it. And I, when I was first going through it, you know, I was kind of, not completely, but kind of had this mindset of, okay, here's some boxes to tick to have a better relationship with God. And now I realize here's some ideas of ways to build to know Him better. And that's what I want to leave you with. Some ideas of how you can know God better. This is, every one of these isn't going to be, it's not like a checklist, okay, I did that, I did that, I did that, I did that. No, but it's just a reminder to help you think through, how am I doing? And here's a QR code of, to get that list. And so, that, that list is something that you can look at, you know, once a week or something like that. Just to review, reflect, consider how you're doing. It's, it's on our, our website, the TICF Global, uh, I can't even read that. What is it? It's TICF Global uh, Post and How Am I Doing? Um, and the, the Bible verse there. Uh, should be our prayer. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there be any hurtful way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. Father, we pray that you would do that. Reveal to us anything that's stopping us from knowing you better.